Welcome back to my channel. I'm Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com, and here are three common misconceptions when developing an HTTP API. We all get caught in the trap of following what seems to be an industry standard, or we're just following certain patterns because everybody else does it. Here are three common misconceptions that I see that hopefully will make you start thinking about other parts of your system and other best practices you're applying, and do they really make sense in your context? Thank you to Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So the first misconception is related to custom headers. And I think it's an awesome example that illustrates oftentimes where we consume another HTTP API and it does it this way. And we just think, okay, well, that's the standard way of doing it. Let me know in the comments if you thought this was how you define a custom header. Let's say a response header. So we have our standard headers here of content type, the encoding date, maybe the server that returned it, but we wanted to find our own custom header. Typically you would see this, you would add X dash, whatever it is that you want and the value. But the key thing here is that people think that you need to prefix this with an X. But that was deprecated over 10 years ago now, but it has such a long history and because everybody seemingly does it, that's why you see that X prefix everywhere. Still, even now today, 10 years after this RFC was posted. I'll have a link in the description. It's kind of worth reading if you want to see some of the history of why it exists. But it's one of those things where it's a misconception of like, everybody's doing it. Seems like an industry standard. Not anymore. Hasn't been that way for a while. The point is, is that things evolve, things change. And just because everybody still seemingly is doing something doesn't necessarily mean that that even makes sense anymore. So just think about your own system, as I mentioned, thinking about what are you doing that you think makes sense because everybody's doing it, but why is everybody doing it? The second misconception is forcing the idea that you have to treat your HTTP API as CRUD over resources, which ultimately are either entities or objects within your system. I usually call this entity services, but Alex Moore, a long time ago now posted this, called it object as resource, which I reference. A resource maps one-to-one-ish to an object in your service application logic. And URIs and HTTP methods are given convention mappings to CRUD operations. Now we're all used to seeing this. A get is a select, a post is an insert or some type of create, a put is updating that entity, a patch is a partial update of that entity, and a delete is a delete of that entity. So if we are talking about customers, maybe we have get customers, that particular URI, it's a list, the collection of the customers returning, or the second one, just with the one, two, three is the identifier of whatever that customer is. We're selecting that particular one. The list goes on. This is what you typically think of as the standard way of developing an HTTP API. We're kind of resource driven by nouns and our actions are just the HTTP methods. Why is this a misconception? Because everybody follows it, but it doesn't have to be this way, especially if your context in a given situation isn't CRUD driven. HTTP methods aren't directly related to CRUD. They don't have to be, everybody's just treating them that way. As an example, here's Stripe's API where they kind of follow this where CRUD is appropriate, but they don't follow it exactly. And where CRUD's not appropriate, they don't follow it at all. So you can see for customers, you can create a customer with a post, a get to fetch an individual customer. They have a post for updating a customer, but for searching, they don't use the existing get customers route, they actually have an explicit route for searching. And where this deviates even more is where CRUD doesn't fit because you wanna be explicit about the actions somebody's trying to perform. And you can't always necessarily do that around resources and having the HTTP methods be related to CRUD. It's not CRUD, you're being explicit about the action an end user needs to perform. So if we look at payment intents, we have various things like, for example, confirming a payment intent, capturing it, canceling it, um, doing the increment authorization, the verify uh, micro deposits. There's all these very specific actions that's not derived around CRUD and thinking about get, post, put, delete. They're very specific actions that you need to apply and that's what they want to expose. And it just doesn't fit CRUD, nor should it. Don't get hung up thinking that you have to expose resources as entities and that you have to be using HP methods mapped as CRUD. You do not. You can be explicit where you need to be explicit about the actions a user needs to perform. You'll notice that I haven't used the term REST and that's deliberate because I think there's too much bike shedding. There's too much dogma around it. I think it's really lost all meaning and rather it's turned into a JSON API over HTTP that's generally CRUD. 
which is really not what it is. So rather, I'll just use the term HTTP API, build one that suits your context. The third misconception is about how you version your API. And there's typical ways that people do this, is that you could have it in the URI, you have your version there, so you have V1, and then you can move to V2. Issue here is you're moving your entire API, versioning it the entire thing at once. Same thing here is that you could define it in the requests and the responses. You could be specifying your request saying, okay, API version, we don't need the X prefix there, saying we're requesting version one when we make this request. If we have a new version that comes out, our clients can then request that. Another typical way is with the content type and your accept headers, the same type of idea is when you send the request, you can say, hey, I'm accepting this particular response. This is the request that I'm making. It could be V2. And we have application vendor, my app, V2 plus JSON. So there's different ways that you can do this. Or where I think this is a little bit, that's why I say it's a misconception. The answer could be don't version your API. Now you may be thinking, okay, Derek, you're crazy. We need to version our API. We're gonna make breaking changes. Sure, but realize that when you're making breaking changes, you're putting the burden on consumers. Now, depending on what type of app you're building, whether it's public, private, realize you're putting a lot of burden on those concern, on your consumers, which are ultimately your customers. Do you wanna be doing that? Now, yes, you can make backwards compatible changes all the time. It's just adding additional properties shouldn't break consumers. Now, there will be situations where you do actually need to make some backwards incompatible, some type of breaking change but there's ways to handle that. So how do you not version? Well, as an example, like I mentioned, if you don't have any breaking changes, I could just add something like name, that's totally fine. But the key part of this is not changing this existing route in any meaningful way. So the thing is, is let's say we have some new route for searching orders because our current listing orders, just like Stripe had, we want something very different. Well, now I could add a separate link that the, our API consumes and understands that, okay, when I get this response back, I know I have this search orders option and that's where this particular route is. Why does this matter? Because this is hypermedia. You're realizing that I'm not constructing URIs. I'm actually just using links and understanding that these URIs are given to me by the server. Yes, you're gonna need to understand, look at the docs, look how, what the response is gonna be, but you can add new routes to actually version existing routes or to add new functionality. You don't have to version in your entire API in one go. I mentioned in a previous video that I'll have a link at the very end of this video to how to make your API evolvable. And one of the ways is using hypermedia. We get caught up all the time of kind of following the trend or what we think are industry standards ways of doing things, even though those standards may have changed or they're not really even applicable to our context. A lot of times we kind of get into this dogma of the, in our industry of just, this is how something's done. And then over time, the understanding kind of, kind of changes a little bit and it's no longer really even following the original intent. And we just kind of follow things to follow things. I hope with this video, you really kind of start looking about what you're doing in your system, what you think is a best practice because somebody else is doing it or some big company that you see is doing it. But does it really make sense in your context? If you enjoy topics like this and you want to chat with other software developers about software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. Check the link out in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.